Recording is on. Hi, everybody. Welcome back on the channel. Well, today we will have a smart uh, talk with uh, Luke. So how are you, Luke? Uh, doing good. How are you today? Yeah, I'm fine, too. I'm fine. Yep. Yeah. So All right, let's have some fun. Let's have some Monero fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Let's, you know, make the point for Monero and show the Bitcoin maximalist uh, that I think we, we have some points to make, right? Sure. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, um, I know that uh, you kind of describe yourself as a Monero maximalist. So why and what are the most important points for you for Monero? Well, I, I think to understand, I mean, first, you got to talk about the term maximalist, right? When I say that, like when a Bitcoin maxi calls himself a maximalist, what does that mean? Um, usually it means that you're more of a one chain person. You have the idea that most of the, the cryptocurrencies out there, firstly, they're not even currencies. Uh, but secondly, most of them are just, I mean, they're really crowdfunding mechanisms for businesses, right? A lot of the times. Um, and the, the original lightning in a bottle of Bitcoin is this idea of digital scarcity and a, a scheme with mining and all of these things that created a system that didn't require a central intermediary, okay, that could still have digital scarcity, right? That, that's the whole point. So a Bitcoin maximalist is usually someone who says, well, listen, um, all these people making all these different coins, they're wasting their time because what they should be doing is they should be building on the chain that we already have. Like the Bitcoin network, let's say it's you know a little below a trillion dollars market cap. It would be much wiser for people to build software on top of Bitcoin, right? Because it's already this pre-existing method or this mm -hmm. pre-existing system. Like it has... It has some smart contracting abilities that are minimalistic compared to something like Ethereum. Um, but the, the reason that, well, one of the main reasons that people don't build on top of Bitcoin uh, or try to use one network is because you can make money not doing that, right? You can make your own coin, you can pump and dump it, you can do things like that. So, uh, you know, Bitcoin maxis are fundamentally like they're suspicious of all altcoins, Monero included, because they just, uh, put it in there, you know, with the same category. Um, but as to the difference between Bitcoin and Monero, like why why should anyone, how is Bitcoin not, or how is Monero not just some like crappy scam coin? Well, firstly, Bitcoin or Monero um, kind of preserves the original Bitcoin ethos. I, I, I think it, um, uh, I, it has, it still has all the decentralization of the original Bitcoin project, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there is a narrow team, but there's no CEO. There's not like, it, there's not like, it, there's not a pre-mine or anything like that, right? So it has all the those ideals of Bitcoin, um, but it also does basically everything that Bitcoin does wrong, right? Right. So the, <laughs> the obvious one that most people know about is, of course, privacy, right? So. Um, privacy is something that, again, at the beginning, people just think, oh, it's like for, for weirdos or criminals or something like that. But privacy is a necessary function of a currency. And in fact, even the fiat system has privacy built into it. You know, cash is private. Um, you know, even credit cards, they're private and they're not private between you and MasterCard. They know that you're spending, but your next door neighbor doesn't know what you're spending. And no, that is not interesting. The case with very interesting. So you mean that the current system that we are using right now is more private than Bitcoin? Oh, a hundred percent, definitely. Um, because Bitcoin, I mean, when you spend something on a Visa card, it does not go to some. It doesn't go to Visa.com where anyone can view it. However, really? that is literally what Bitcoin does. It you put you can look in any block explorer. It's public information that it's out there. And I know, at least in the United States, and this almost is, is trivial, but recently a court ruled, of course, uh, that the federal government doesn't need a you know any kind of warrant to monitor your Bitcoin transactions because they're literally right there on the internet, right? Uh, whereas that is the case in the fiat system. Like if you're a criminal who's using American dollars and you're hiding things in a bank, the, the government at least needs a warrant, you know? They don't ma automatically know what you're doing, whereas that is the case in Bitcoin. That's substantially worse. Um, yeah, very, very good point, you know? And something we don't usually think about, but yes, actually Bitcoin is less private than, um, than uh, the current system. 
Yeah. So, and I think no. that I'll, I'll go ahead and say, you no. know, Bitcoin maximalists will know this. Like they, they know that this is happening. They know that Bitcoin's out there and, um, you know, it's, it's very unprivate. But in their minds, I think their idea is they want to have this dumb base layer that transacts value, it preserves digital scarcity, and it doesn't really do anything else. Like privacy, that's a feature that we can add on, you know, with some layer over the lightning network or something like that. <laughs> that, that is their way of, of thinking about that. And I, it's a kind of, it, it's kind of building your house on sand, you know, in the, in the old the old parable of Jesus where, you know, Bitcoin fundamentally, it, it's, they, they put it in terms of being a simple technology, but it really can't do the most basic thing that money does. And it, instead, Bitcoin, in order to be functional, you have to use it through all of these application layers. Whereas Monero, you know, you can actually just, it, it works how you expect. You don't, a lot of people think that Monero, because it's like this privacy coin or hackers, oh man, all these people who know about technology use it. No, it's actually substantially easier to use the Bit than Bitcoin because you don't have to jump through all of these hoops to preserve basic privacy. Yeah, so you mean like the importance of layer one, right? Like uh, Bitcoin, yeah. they are building on top of layer two. Maybe it will be layer three, layer four one day, you know? So, right. yeah, okay. Very, very good yeah, and, and I, I will say, you know, I'm not against having Bitcoin. I think, uh, in, in fact one realistic thing about the world is that there are many times where the worst technological standard uh, becomes the standard just because it's first there or it's more popular. And that could be the case, unfortunately, with Bitcoin and Monero. It might be that Bitcoin just has so much momentum behind it that, and, you know, most people in the cryptocurrency sphere, they don't, they don't know what's going on. Uh, it might be that people keep going on to it, you know, and, you know, oh, Monero, I don't need that. But I think one thing that recent events have shown, uh, we've had a lot of things happen just in the past month that show the ridiculousness of Bitcoin um, in privacy. Um, and of course, we're mentioning privacy now, but we should say Monero does everything else right too. But in, in the state of privacy, right? So, you know, you had the Canadian government basically try to shut down people's bank accounts. And when people started using cryptocurrency, well, guess what? Bitcoin is just as easy, easily monitorable. And if you're a normal person who doesn't give a crap about Bitcoin, you just want to cash it out uh, and you can you only know how to use a know your customer exchange. Well, that's basically just the same thing as you, you know, they, they can stop your Bitcoin in the same way that they can stop your Canadian dollars. Right. Yes. So and, and mind you, these people who have who are having their accounts shut down like this, this isn't drug dealers. This isn't like criminals. Um you know, th these are pretty much normal people. And I, I, in the past five years, you have just seen this massive need for normal people to have private currency. It is not just, it's not a niche thing. You're not a weirdo if you need it. We, we have really just never had an environment like Bitcoin where you have a currency that can be monitored like it. So we're not even used to it being like a, a thing, a possibility. It's much more absurd than people realize. Yeah, completely. <laughs> And when you say the environment with the inflation and everything, I mean, when Satoshi, he created Bitcoin, you know, uh, back in 2008, 2009, well, the environment was extremely different from now. But th his creation was for the environment that we have right now. I mean, the U.S. government, I think they, are, they have a budget of something like $80 billion for a new agency that is going to spy on cryptocurrency, something like that. So imagine what will happen, you know, for Bitcoin when they will deploy all their resources, you know. So yeah. I have a yeah, question. And, and yeah. Yeah, tell me. The hope that Bitcoin maxis will have is that, oh, eventually we will have this in Bitcoin. We will have the Lightning Network and, you know, maybe a little bit more to make it private. But the, the reality is we need that now. And there's really no reason to have a base layer that does not have privacy built into it, especially, you know, Monero doesn't have this yet, but I kind of expect that they will add it, obviously, in the next 10 years or so. But some kind of generalized zero knowledge proofs instead of, you know, we use ring signatures now, which suffice. Um, but, you know, if, if you can use zero knowledge proofs for transactions, they're not even like ring signatures where they're a little larger. This is something that theoretically you could build Bitcoin with. Like you don't have you don't even have to do this, this other stuff. But the reality is, you know, a lot of people in Bitcoin, they're just kind of stuck with the. Uh, well, Bitcoin's going to stay the way it is. It's stable. 
Um, and we don't, we'll just build stuff on top of it. And you know, that I, I find that very suspect for many reasons. Um, yeah, completely. for me as well, you know, this narrative saying that like there is Bitcoin and nothing else matters, you know, I personally, I, I cannot understand, you know, because yeah. uh, I think at, at least there will be a, a duopole between Bitcoin and Monero. But mm -hmm. uh, for me, now it's a possibility that uh, Monero is going to take the lead at mm -hmm. one point. You know, I remember yeah. uh, it was um, John McAfee, you know, he, he has uh, this video on the Internet where he says that Bitcoin is, is going to be useless and uh, Monero is going to become the only cryptocurrency, you know, because at one point nobody will want to own Bitcoin. And I remember, you know, it was like one or two years ago when I first heard this. And at, at, at first it was it was unbelievable for me. You know, I was like, well, he's crazy to think that. But right now I'm like, well, I, I think he he's right. You know, I mean, I think he was right and he's still and that at, at the end of the day, it's very possible that uh, nobody's going to want to own Bitcoin. Yeah, well, yeah. I think um, uh, I am less so I'm less against big. Well, OK, I don't want to say I'm less against Bitcoin, but I'll say it this way. Holding Bitcoin is not a big issue. It's easy to hold Bitcoin. That's not a problem. The issue is using it. Um, because, you know, if you just have some Bitcoin at some address that's not tied to your name, that's no big problem, right? But in the process of using it, that is when the privacy issues arise. That is when, um, you know, the transaction fee issues arise and all of this kind of stuff. Whoa, connection. Do you hear me? Oh, did you lose me for a second? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we're back. Okay. So, you know, back in the day when you had a, everything good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, had kind of a bimetallic standard with gold and silver. A lot of the times, um, you know, gold was used to hold on to and you wouldn't transact with that because there were many disadvantages. You'd use silver for that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I view Bitcoin and Monero right now. Uh, but again, the ideal would be people using the technology that, you know, is more useful for, for exchange and that is Monero. Okay. Uh, now that's, no, go ahead. Yeah, excuse me. Just on this point, I, I don't especially agree, you know, because okay. when you say that you can store your value on Bitcoin and then uh, just, I mean, it's not a problem if you store your value on Bitcoin and maybe you can, the problem is only when you want to use it. Well, let's say you have a certain amount on Bitcoin, right? And at one point you want to just use a part of this amount. Not everything, just a part of this. Do you see how complicated it becomes? Because the moment you spend a huge XO, right? Anybody will see the whole amount that you have, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you truly want, you know, to to keep certain information for yourself, it truly becomes like it, it, this is hell, you know. If you want to just spend a part of this, how do you do that, you know? Yeah, I, I think you're definitely right. I think it is hell. And I think it is stupid and we shouldn't be doing it. But I'm just saying, realistically speaking, I mean, we're, we're talking about the cryptocurrency sphere right now is full of people who don't even who think they own Bitcoin or Monero, but they don't really because they own it on some custodial exchange. OK, most people out there do not even understand what the technology they're using. And I think realistically speaking, I see that Bitcoin is it, I mean, it's going to continue. I expect it to continue. And I, I do hope I'm not against the, the layer two thing. Like, I hope those people have a lot of success in making Bitcoin better. But I would prefer if the solutions were solved at the ground level. That That's more of my view. There's no reason for Bitcoin to have to be as open as it is other than mind you, there there is a raw conservatism in Bitcoin where they they're just like, listen, we're not going to add something. Uh, you know, recently they added Schnorr signatures, which have existed for the entire, uh, you know, history of Bitcoin. Right. Um, but uh, they, you know, they were just, oh, these haven't been vetted by the real world yet. So we're not going to add them to Bitcoin yet. So it, it, it's only been 10 years later that they're like, OK, they've been around enough. We'll add them. We trust them, you know, and that is kind of the conservatism in, in Bitcoin. And I definitely understand that, but definitely for individual people using Bitcoin. I mean, if if I, it would be a bad thing for me to tell people to transact with Bitcoin right now, because there are so many complications they have to deal with in maintaining privacy that using Monero is just the better option um, for better or for worse. And hey, I hope Bitcoin works out. 
I just don't necessarily think that it's going to be as clean as people expect it to be. Yeah, yeah, completely. And I, I want uh, at one point you said Moneo does uh, privacy right, but beyond that, he does he does also everything right. So what beyond privacy does Moneo do so well? Uh, well, Bitcoin has a couple of problems within it. I mean, the, there are two main ones, I think. One is the issue of whether or not the system will continue as Bitcoin having continues and continues, right? Um, so that is when miners get absolutely no mining reward, will they still mine? <laughs> um, and I, I think, of course, mining will end in Bitcoin sometime in the next century. It might be later in the next century. I, I'm not quite sure, but yeah. um, I, I don't think that there, I've never seen uh, enough cryptography or game theory to argue that Bitcoin can actually continue working on raw transaction fees. Okay. So Monero, of course, solves this by having tail emission and Monero is actually going to go into tail emission sometime soon. Um, and that is just constantly providing an incentive for miners to mine, right? Whereas in Bitcoin, I mean, if you do the math, okay, you can do the math like on a piece of paper because it's really easy when it comes to Bitcoin. So if you ask right at the top, like what, how many transactions can Bitcoin fit into a block? So there's a block made every 10 minutes. And if you take the absolute most sympathetic to Bitcoin view of it, um, you can process around, you know, six transactions per second maximum. So that means, you know, 600 per minute. That means 6,000 every 10 minutes, right? So um, so 6,000, put that in one box in your head. So another number to realize is right now, so Bitcoin mining, we expect it to scale up in the future. We expect there to be more people mining Bitcoin, right? I, I think everyone agrees on that. Uh, mm -hmm. And we kind of need that as the computing power in the world increases. You don't want to have some party jump onto the scene uh, with enough power to do a 51% attack, right? Yeah. So you you expect the um, the returns to, you know, how much Bitcoin miners are paid per block to increase over time. Um, so right now, if you mine a Bitcoin block, you get around a quarter of a million dollars, okay? So let's say we go to the future, and in the future, let's be highly sympathetic to Bitcoin, okay? Let's say that it, they only require a quarter of a million dollars to be incentivized to, you know, mine Bitcoin. Let's say that's enough. Now, okay. in real life, it would probably be a hundred times that much. But let's say a quarter of a million dollars. I'm going to pull up my calculator. Um, so a quarter of a million dollars, and then divide that by the six thousand transactions that Bitcoin does in okay. a block. So if you do that, you will get a number around $41.67. Now, what is that? That is the average Bitcoin transaction fee, okay, at the end of this. Now, this is me being as this is me as being sympathetic as possible, okay? This is assuming that mining costs are not going to increase. In reality, they will be up by, you know, if they're up by 10 times, it's not going to be $40 to transact Bitcoin. It's going to be $400 to transact Bitcoin. I expect it to be even higher than that. So what this means is that, you know, it, how are you going to come up with the transaction fees to maintain the system? If Bitcoin continues as it is, right, um, that means everyone will have to use the Lightning Network. Everyone has to use Layer 2. And the, the core functionality of Bitcoin is now something only for very rich people. If transaction fees get to thousands of dollars, you're not going to be using Bitcoin. You're going to be using the Lightning Network. And you better hope that it be absolutely like pure and immaculate and there's no decentralization problems there's no you know any any it has to be perfect hermetically sealed and at that point you're not using bitcoin you're using like all of these other applications and theoretically bitcoins at the bottom and you know the, the problem that i have with the layer two solutions just in general is the fact that if your currency only does one thing like bitcoin where it secures value and nothing else what that means is when you have a worldwide currency or a worldwide financial system based on top of it and governments that are making laws about it uh, and you have the lightning network, you have all these other things that can be regulated. It's pretty easy for a government to come in and say, OK, here's what we're going to do. Software update, everyone. It's now mandatory. Instead of using the Bitcoin protocol, we're going to use the Bitcoin plus protocol. 
And we're going to say that, you know, this is like Bitcoin, but we can print Bitcoin or something like that. Um, we, when you're becoming reliant on layer twos, that's the kind of stuff that happens, right? Um, and and when you when you look at the transaction fee problem, it's very obvious that Bitcoin is not going to it, it's not going to work. You, like you have to put things on top of it for it to work, and that is another attack vector. What you say is crazy, you know, because this is exactly what is. I mean, there is someone who is trying to do that. But it's not even going coming from the government. You know, it's coming from the Bitcoin community. So they are working right now. You know, someone has had an idea of cre creating something like they call Bitcoin pool. So the idea is that <laughs> due to the fact that there is a lack of liquidity of uh, Bitcoin on uh, because um, of the fact, you know, for the light network, it's there is not enough Bitcoin on the layer two. So they want to create something they call a Bitcoin pool. Where well, basically several people own UTXOs <laughs> and then they can exchange it uh, easily because uh, there are more people to, to own it, you know. Um, yeah, so, so that's crazy. Right now I'm trying to, to look at the name of uh, the person who did that, but that's crazy, you know. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I was saying that as if I expected to be some dystopian fantasy in 50 years that people look back and say is right. But if something like that is already happening, that's... <laughs> you know, that's, that's funny. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin in the real world. Um, just I don't know if you, this is the direction you want to go in. But one thing that I looked into recently yeah. is Bitcoin in the one country where it's accepted as legal tender. Right. So El Salvador, which which I think is still great news, like El Salvador is using Bitcoin as legal tender. Right. So just by itself, that, hey, that's good on paper. El Salvador. Salvadorians, Salvadorians, whatever, they won't have to pay capital gains tax on their car. Okay, that's nice. That That's nice. But, you know, if you went back in time and told Satoshi what form this would be in, um, I think he would have never created Bitcoin because, you know, firstly, um, how Bitcoin got there, there was this company called Strike, which, you know, was very close to the, the Salvadorian president and kind of lobbied him to do it. And I heard things about Strike that were not very good sounding, right? Because it's this lightning network thing, which of course is know your customer, excuse me, know your customer, uh, anti-money uh, money laundering things. It uses the lightning network. I think they even have non-custodial wallets, all this kind of bad stuff. And I was like, oh, that's that's a little suspicious. But then even worse than that, the Salvadorian government, actually, I don't know if you know this, but they actually created their own wallet, wallet, quote unquote, Bitcoin wallet, that they actually gave money. They told people, if you use this, you get $20 free in Bitcoin. Okay. And what, what happens, people get this, um, this proprietary software that they run on their phone. It's a government app. No one can look at the source code, right? Um, the first thing it does is ask them to give your ID, your government ID, your address, take a picture of yourself, everything like that. And this now is Bitcoin. And mind you, you get the $20 and you can't actually cash it out. It's not really your money. You have to spend it. it. I mean, it's like a you have to spend it on something else or something like that. It's not. And of course, it's a custodial wallet. Right. Uh, so the government of El Salvador. It, I mean, this is a disaster. This is the exact opposite of what Bitcoin is about. It's about self custodianship of your own money and freedom and uh, anonymity and all of these things. And Bitcoin is now rolling out on the world stage, representing absolutely the opposite of all of that. And, and this is just a disaster. And for anyone to, um, you know, sure, you use Bitcoin the right way in El Salvador, and that's fantastic. But this is a, a great example of how manipulatable the system is and how a lot of people, unfortunately, who don't know any better are just going along with, oh, wow, this is great. Oh, man. So, yeah, I mean, that's it. That's, that's the whole thing, you know, that right now, I mean, the system is completely changing and Bitcoin, it has lost all the things that made it uh, a cryptocurrency. And the consequence now, I think, is that if we don't like do the point for Monero, uh, I mean, the, the, the whole cryptocurrency thing is going to vanish, you know, because the, the goal, the original goal of Satoshi was to, to change the society. And right now, Bitcoin is not doing that, you know, and uh, that's why I believe yeah. that. Monero in the future, you know, it's going to 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 take off and become more and more the true and only cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is it's going to become, I think, a financial asset. You know, 
Yeah, yeah. And you, if you look at people nowadays, I mean, one of the big ones now is uh, hold on, let me change something with my screen here. But one of the big guys nowadays in Bitcoin is Michael Saylor, uh, which I guess you know people know about. And I remember, you know, first I, I heard some things about Saylor. Uh, and I saw some videos of his and I was like, OK, they're interesting. They're getting normal people into cryptocurrency and stuff like that. Um, but I remember watching his interview with Tucker Carlson, which was probably the stupidest thing. I've most embarrassing and like most anti Bitcoin thing I've ever seen in my life because the guy gets on. And it, well, my theory, actually, it, which I think there's evidence of this, is that Michael Saylor actually doesn't even have custodianship over his own Bitcoin. Like he is one of these boomers who thinks of it as basically an index fund. And he will drop drop the names of decentralization and, you know, the peer to peer and crap like that. Actually, very little him. He very I mean, he's mostly a number go up guy who's talking about digital scarcity. Um, but really, there's been this new there's a new Bitcoiner. There's the 2020 Bitcoiner where it's someone who cares a lot about numbers. And you think of Bitcoin as being kind of like an asset um, or, or, or like something equivalent to stocks. It's like stocks, but better. You put money in it and it goes up. And like, that's the point of it. Um, and people are forgetting about the whole, you know, yes, you can make money from cryptocurrency. Like when you have digital scarcity and you are an early adopter, by definition, you will be making lots of returns, but that is not the reason that it exists. And it does, if you get to the point where everyone who is using Bitcoin is using an ID and is directly monitored by the government without needing a warrant, and has their identity tied to it and has five different cryptocurrency platforms that can deplatform them at any point, you're not using Bitcoin. You're not using anything reminiscent of cryptocurrency. And a lot of people get it twisted. They think that because they have an account at some site that's denominated in Bitcoin, that that means they own it. And in reality, if you don't have a private wallet, you own nothing. That's how it is. And a lot of people don't know that. Know that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your sentence, the 2020 Bitcoiner, I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, that, that's something, you know, exactly. There are so many people that are joining Bitcoin just for the gains, just for this. And they only know about the numbers. It goes up, it goes up. And yes, exactly. For them, it is a financial asset. And I think that in the coming years, when I was going to emerge, I, I, I think uh, it will have much more gains than, than Bitcoin, but that's not the point. You know, the point is to truly have a cryptocurrency and give the freedom back to, to the people. You know, I think some people have this idea that, well, we have to tell normies out there that you can make money on Bitcoin or you can make money in cryptocurrency. Otherwise, they're not going to be interested. But that is not the case. Like these technologies, if you understand what they're really for, and that is transacting value without an intermediary. That is something fun. That sounds boring. That sounds dry. But that is actually one of the greatest things that could ever happen to, to mankind, right? If a normal person understood the benefits of that, it would be so fantastic, right? So if someone wants to send you Monero, they can just send you Monero, right? Whereas let's say you have a put, you know, someone wants to, oh, I want to donate to Kevin. Let me go to his PayPal. Well, your PayPal is tied to your bank, which is tied to you know, uh, also your MasterCard or Visa card you might use on PayPal, which is tied to, you know, some other payment processor. You might have Stripe in there or other things, and it's tied to someone. Else. All of these are different platforms. That doesn't just mean software bloat, things you don't need to, you know, parties you do not need to transact, but parties where the government can make requests of them. Uh, they You can be deplatformed. I mean, PayPal is a good example of a platform that pretty routinely uh, mm -hmm. will ban people. Um, and banks are kind of the same way in that they are place vectors of attack. And it's it's just a totally liberating thing that anyone right now could start um, something like a BTC pay server, which also can process Mon Monero. And you can set that up for your business and you can transact with someone in a private way, even with Bitcoin. Like if you self-host um, you know, your own BTC, BTC pay server, every transaction is getting a new address. So there's a layer of privacy there too. But of course, Monero, you don't even need that, right? Mm -hmm. um, either way, uh, you can be a full custodian of your technology, even if you don't necessarily understand how it works. And you can build something much greater off of that without having to worry about your bank's policies about, you know, how you move money around or, or something like that. 
It's it's just something that is inherently valuable. And now that things have gotten worse in terms of censorship, um, this is something that people are thinking more about. So, yeah, with the current events, you know, with uh, Canada, Russia, you know, maybe you want to talk about it because I think that Bitcoin is not it's not like doing what it was supposed to do. You know, if uh, the Canadian truckers, if they use Bitcoin, I think there are some issues, right? Yeah, well, of course, Bitcoin does what it's supposed to do. It can transact value, but it comes with a lot of consequences in that, again, you are broadcasting to the world what the transaction you're doing is, right? So, I, I mean, if you, uh, I mean, that's a pretty good example, the, the Canadian truckers or something like that. And functionally, and here's another issue, mind you. The goal of cryptocurrency is for to is really to have an economy where people use it. Okay, people want to use Monero. They want to use Bitcoin. That is the purpose of it. The purpose of it is not to get into it, sit there for an, a year or so, and then cash out into cash. Like if my, I think of if I own a cryptocurrency, I have no. I own it because I expect it to be the software that it uses to be useful. And I'm not going to trade that for dollars. That's just, I'm not interested in gains. And I'd rather just not pay capital gains that, frankly. <laughs> um, so the purpose of the this, if you look at uh, cryptocurrency, you should really not look at it as a digital object, but really software. And when you understand it like that, this software network is inherently useful for what it does. That is something that I, I can be involved with and Owning it itself, if you can use it, if you can use Monero, right, that is, some, I don't need to worry about cashing out or cashing in or anything like that once I'm invested in it. But the problem with people who look at things in terms of I want to make money is they look at Bitcoin as a means to more dollars. So that means they are using banks. They are thinking in terms of, oh, well, I need to know your customer exchange and I need a Bitcoin is so hard to use. Monero is so hard to use. Oh, Monero has been delisted by all these exchanges. And the correct response to that is that's good. We don't want Monero, like Monero is not here to look like an index fund on some kind of exchange. The goal is creating an economy that can exist on its own and doesn't need the rest of it. And in fact, in the case of Monero, um, it is a, if you are storing Monero on a centralized exchange, not only are you insane and you don't actually own that Monero, um, but it's also, you are really harming other Monero users because if you, if, of course, this company has your view key, they really have your spin key too. So they can decrease the anon set of everyone else. They, they can tell which transactions of that person are legitimate or not, and therefore get into the ring signatures of other people. So I think where money, where the people who are thinking about money making get it wrong is that it's not about making US dollars. It's about getting cryptocurrency and using it in an economy that is gradually going to emerge. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Because, you know, I keep saying uh, uh, freedom back to the people. And when I say this, this is exactly what I mean. You know, it's about creating a new economy that belongs to the people and where the government, they cannot intervene. Because right, when right. you said, you said, yes, if you don't cash out, they are, are not going to, to tax you. Well, now they are starting to talk about the capital gains. So even if you, you don't say, you know, they are going to come for people to, to tax people. And I think that this question of taxes, I don't know what you think about it. But me personally, you know, um, yeah, I, I know it's a pretty issue and that some people don't like to, 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 to bring that. But personally, I think that uh, the, the question of taxes, you know, is central as well, because it is the way for governments to uh, keep doing inflation, because then if they can... Uh, increase the taxes on the people, then um, they can can still print money and keep going with inflation. You know, but I, I think the the main goal of cryptocurrency is also to um, to give a new tool for the people to protect against inflation and just also to protect against uh, over taxation. You know, right? I, I think we can talk about inflation in a bit, but I I will say that um, um, a lot of people become bears and bulls when you're talking about regulation. And again, a lot of people are, oh my goodness, Monero has been delisted by exchanges. The world is over. Um, I look at regula, now I don't support regulation of cryptocurrency, but I can't help but thinking that a lot of it is going to work to our benefit. 
And you, you probably remember what I said at the very beginning, where a lot of altcoins out there, they're really just ways of making money. They're crowdfunding mechanisms for companies. And what regulation does is, well, really, you can only aim regulation at centralized parties. It's very, if, you know, the government says that BISC is now illegal, it's very difficult to enforce that, right? Because BISC yeah. is a peer-to-peer -peer platform um, transacting in a peer-to-peer -peer way. That is fundamentally something that the government, until they have nanobots flying around everywhere, they cannot enforce. Cryptocurrency regulation, however, hurts centralized exchanges. It makes things difficult for them. It makes it harder for scam coins and things like that. So in most cases where I see cryptocurrency regulation, again, I don't support it, but I do feel that it is inevitably going to nudge people in the right direction because the goal, you know, I'm not, there, there are people they call compliance cucks out there. I'm not one of those. And I'm also not one of those guys who's like, yeah, the government can't touch me. Bitcoin, man. Whoa, man. I'm not one of those guys who like wants to talk about buying drugs or something illegal. I don't, I don't even endorse illegal behavior. Um, I, my view is that when you look at the technology, you want to make something for which regulation is irrelevant. It, it's if you're if you're worried about regulation, if you're worried about censorship, if you're worried about spying, you're using bad technology. You need to make technology that makes what the government says just not matter. Make it totally unenforceable. We in the case of Monero, we at least want something as good as the money that they print, because cash, of course, already has privacy features that far exceed any non-private cryptocurrency. And yes, you can dodge taxes with cash. Yes, you can um, do illegal things with cash. Um, and that's true of a private currency. But we at least want a private currency to be as good as cash that is already existing, you know? Yeah, very important point, you know, that um, at least Monero does what the current system does, you know. But uh, the thing I think that Bitcoin maximalists don't realize is that the few percentage that Bitcoin is lacking, which is privacy, fungibility, makes a world difference. I mean, the details lead to, to, to crazy things, you know. When, when you think about it, like uh, the human DNA, the difference between human DNA and some animals' DNA is like less than 1%. You know, it's like the 0.001% of difference, but it makes the world difference, you know. And I think between Monero and Bitcoin, that's it. You know, they think they have a cryptocurrency that has everything, just it's lacking this few percentage and this lack is makes the world difference, I think. Yeah, I do think there's one big similarity between normal people out there and Bitcoiners, and that is neither of them have ever actually used Bitcoin for anything. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> the main problem is that people, again, what has happened with a lot of Bitcoiners is they they bought it sometime, you know, maybe a couple of years ago, maybe a long time ago, and they sat on it and they got filthy sinking rich in some cases. And they think that by virtue of having made money or by virtue of being part of this project, that that means some inherent success or that it's going to it's it, it's going to be what it purports to be. And I don't think that's the case. And I think, um, you know, in so many cases, um, I mean, the, the fact I mean, we, we had the other month. What was it like the Bitfinex hack? Was it Bitfinex? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's yeah, it from? Yeah. There are so many can, cases. Right? What do you say? Wazel Khan. You, What's you're, that talking about, you're talking about the, the couple that... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, I didn't know their names, but... Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, that's a good example where, you know, these guys... And, and of course, this applies to crime, but this applies to everything. Where you do something a million years ago, and every like every step you take is visible, Right. And, you know, of course, that's obvious in crime where you have all these governmental agencies, you know, following you and, you know, they can uh, they, they did all this stuff, even with Wasabi wallet and stuff to, to see where the money has gone. But I think people are now as time goes on, people will realize more and more how needed this is privacy is for individual people in the same function, because you don't want stalkers. You don't want other people who are, or, you know, people who could potentially blackmail you or something else uh, to be watching your transactions. And no matter how normal you are, like if you, uh, I mean, if you're some lady who's worried about like stalkers following you, 
why would you broadcast all of your transactions to the blockchain, right? It's insane. No one would choose to do that. So why are we using a system that has that by default? And in fact, to avoid it, I mean, there's really no, there's really no set method. I mean, CoinJoin has its problems, you know, all these kind of um, things that people add on to, to Bitcoin. Not only are they hard, they hard to use in, you know, not are not only are they just hard to use for any people. It's like a big rigmarole to get them done, but they actually don't even do what they're supposed to do. I mean, <laughs> there are so many things you know to 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 uh, to say about it, you know. And another thing about the importance mm -hmm. of uh, layer one, as opposed to having a layer two and other services, financial services on top of uh, Bitcoin, and that technically, like, it's not possible, you know, because there is a lack of liquidity on the other layers and everything is linked to the velocity of the money. So for instance, let's say you have like uh, 100,000 Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. This is even, you know, a high number, but let's say, okay, 100,000. Well, if you have like 7 billion people using 100,000 Bitcoin, do you see the problem? I mean, there is not enough liquidity and everything is linked to the velocity of the money, you know, if the money uh, goes very fast, hand to hand. I mean, that might be okay. You know, if uh, someone holds one Bitcoin, I mean, not one Bitcoin, but some Bitcoin for, let's say, one day, and then they exchange it, maybe it's possible. But most people, they will hold their Bitcoin for 20, 30 days before they spend it. You know, when you have money on your wallet, you don't spend it right away. So there is a technical issue. That, I mean, technically, it's it's completely impossible to have enough liquidity for the whole world on another layer. So this is not a problem that we have with Monero because it is layer one. So there is no link between uh, the liquidity and the number of people using it, you know, because all the Monero are available on layer one. So we don't have this problem, you know, because the supply is like, the whole supply can be used for transactions as opposed to Bitcoin, like it will be 100,000 um, Bitcoin for the whole world. So it leads to what they say, you know, like uh, people who will share the owning of Bitcoin through what they call Bitcoin pools or something like this. Like uh, they will share the UTXO and the UTXOs, they will belong to several people. <laughs> so I think that uh, not having everything on the, the layer one is uh, one of the main drawbacks of Bitcoin as well, you know. Yeah, and one of the reasons that is as well is when Bitcoin was created, it was established to have particular properties. So you want it to be peer-to-peer, -peer, obviously. You want people to be able to use it in a non-custodial way that they have autonomy over their Bitcoins. Um, and you know, many it was totally free software, right? It's pseudo-anonymous at least. Uh, you know, people back in the day, no, there weren't these stalking parties who really tried to follow transactions and stuff like that. So functionally, it was pseudo anonymous, right? So Bitcoin had all of these traits. And the issue with building layers on top of it is that you have to make sure that every layer you build on top is still preserves that decentralized nature, that peer to peer nature, the non custodial nature, all of those things. Yeah. And so really what's happening, a lot of Bitcoiners will make the argument against something like Monero, they'll say something like, well, listen, the, the issue with Monero is it has this development team and they're still working on things. There's, they're still adding things. And there is, it's true that there is a le level of trust that you have to have that the Monero team is not going to totally screw things up. Now, you you can fork it if they do screw things up, but then, you know, the network's divided, less people are using it, right? Um, so Bitcoiners will say, well, you know, one nice thing about Bitcoin and its stability is the fact that we don't have to worry about that. But that is nonsensical. What, because what they have to worry about is all of the layers that get on top of Bitcoin. That do they actually preserve the privacy, uh, the the pseudo anonymity, the the peer to peer nature, the non custodial nature? Um, and what we've seen already, uh, what is the fact that when you have layer twos? So on one side, let's say the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is a layer two, and it's you know non custodial. You might argue it's not quite as decentralized. There there's some issues with that. But, you know, I'm not against it. I, I think it's it's fine. Um, there are some problems. But uh, realistically speaking, there there's another layer, too, and that is centralized exchanges. 
Um, this is what Michael Saylor says in a good way. Oh yeah, you know, Coinbase. That's a that's a you know that's a layer two, and that's a valid thing. So what we're already having is that people are gravitating to these things that are easier to use, that are worse, and they're further away from what Bitcoin's supposed to be. So you would you say that exchanges they are layer two or layer three maybe? Uh, well, I mean, if they're using, I don't know, it's kind of metaphorical anyway. Uh, I guess. You know, if you want to say they're using the Lightning Network, then you can say they're built on top of that. But I mean, you know, they're, they're all in. The, the important thing is it's not built into the protocol level. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I had to get, get something. No problem. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, I completely you know, agree with that, with that point. And I think, you know, if we make the, the point against Bitcoin, you know, it's not like, we we want i mean for me you know it doesn't come from a position of uh a eight beacon or something like this you know it's just like i mean it doesn't make any sense to ignore monero's that way you know because of the properties that monero has and i think that right now there is this narrative of building a financial asset and people forget about uh, what makes a, a true cryptocurrency i think there are reasonable listen there are reasonable reasons for people to be skeptical of any cryptocurrency, but Bitcoin and Monero included, um, there are, listen, no crypto is perfect right now. Monero is still under development. There are many things they're thinking of adding. There are many worries that ring signatures, you know, you can go back and figure things out as time goes on, or, you know, there, there are many liabilities. So I think it's a reasonable thing for anyone to say, oh, I'm not 100% sold on this. Um, you know, my position now is that Monero, so Bitcoin is very popular and it has a large network. And I think for that reason, it is, you know, worthwhile to hold. Uh, I don't think that it is a good, you know, it's obviously not good for transactions and stuff like that, whereas Monero is. And of course, I expect, I fully expect Monero to be significantly improved in the next one, two, three, four, five years years and get better and better as it is right now. I mean, realistically speaking, I mean, we can talk about this if you want. No cryptocurrency right now can function as a global currency, Monero included, right? Um, and Monero's issue, you know, it can scale better in the sense that we can have larger blocks and, you know, we have privacy and stuff like that. But still, we have not mass. no crypto has mastered, um, you know, going worldwide in the sense that we would need a blockchain, which is terabytes big right because we have to we're, we have to store all these transactions and other things like that and there are other projects that try to you know minimize that or have some kind of block lattice uh you know instead of a blockchain like there are a lot of problems out there that i don't feel have been fully answered and i think that's understandable um but what i do feel is right now if you want a cryptocurrency that is useful for transactions and can actually do things um, I can't recommend Bitcoin. I can't recommend B Bitcoin Cash or Litecoin or all of these things. Monero does everything right. Um, and Monero stands above all of the other ones. And I am not one of these guys who just wants to invest in coins because, oh, I expect them to go up. I, I would like to have something that is going to be useful. And I expect the Monero network to be, you know, potentially world changing in that respect. Yeah. And about the scalability, you know, there is uh, the DNA data storage that is coming. And if that comes, you know, this is a game changer. And potentially, you know, like it will be possible to store like very, very large blockchain in tiny spaces. So this argument of uh, scalability for Monero, I think, yeah, in the coming years, we will benefit from that, you know. Yeah, I, I will also say this. Um I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're defending Monero. Uh, well, okay, I'll, I'll say this. Um, there are some potential, I mean, let's think realistically, what are the chances that Bitcoin and Monero fail? Okay, that's what you got to think about. And I think there are really two possibilities, well, the three. So the third one, I'll go ahead and say that's like nuclear war and the internet and everything, you know, is destroyed. And in that case, we have bigger things to worry about, right? Um, so ignoring that possibility, which, you know, there is a possibility, um, I, I think there are two things that could happen that would gradually destroy Bitcoin and Monero. Um, one is that some, I th think this is pretty unlikely, but some basic level of cryptography 
or hashing or something else that is required for Bitcoin or elliptic curve cryptography, whatever, some uh, form of that is broken. Now, I view that as highly unlikely. I mean, uh, but it's theoretically a possibility. Something like that could happen. Uh, but I, I think it's pretty safe to bet against that happening, right? Um, there have been case, you know, SHA-1 was was cracked a while back. But, you know, the, the things we have now are orders of magnitude more complex. And I mean, there's reason to think that they will not be crackable, right? Uh, so, but that is technically a possibility. The other possibility is, you know, Bitcoin and uh, Monero are, of course, uh, proof of work um, cryptocurrencies. And there's a lot of FUD about proof of work because, oh, man, it's bad for the environment or so. I mean, it's typical stuff. You know, you know what it is. But realistically speaking, there is a possibility that someone develops a way of reaching decentralized consensus without using proof of work. So proof of stake purports to already be this. I'm sure, you know, you talk on your channel about this, but proof of stake I view as highly suspect. But hypothetically speaking, it is possible that someone could develop this new game theoretic solution to have proof, you know, a decentralized consensus without proof of work. And in that case, Bitcoin and Monero would be dinosauric. It would, they would just be like, look at these old technologies that are using this old, you know, how wasteful they are. Suppose we can do it without having mining or something like that. I mean, this is, this is pie, you know, sky in the pot, sky in the pot, pie in the sky dreaming. But theoretically, it is a, a possibility for us to develop a kind of decentralized consensus. Now, in that case, of course, you, you, you know, you could probably say that, uh, at least in the case of Monero, the Monero team might be, you know, oh, let's see if we can base Monero off of this, change that, that base. And in that case, that would be nice. But theoretically, there is that possibility of some new technology coming out that will make cryptocurrency as we know it kind of obsolete. I mean, the technology you're talking about, I mean, like the quantum computers, it is exactly the definition of that because it can do both. You know, like it can, um, it can on the one way, uh, stop mining because uh, we have seen that there is, if, if the quantum computers comes today, it will stop making um, Bitcoin mining or, um, possible. And the only algorithm that can uh, stand is uh, Randomix. There, there was a report on this. So, and the second thing is that quantum computers, they can break uh, cryptography, you know. And when you say that you don't think that it is likely, well, um, what do you think about quantum computers? Do you think that uh, they are a true threat? And in the coming 10 years, five years, what do you think about it? Um, I am not familiar with them enough to give an educated view on them. Uh, I will say there's some aspects that, of them that I'm skeptical whether, I mean, it's something like AI, uh, my, my view of it in that, um, it's one of those technologies that theoretically based on certain assumptions could make a big impact, but I'm not necessarily sold on if it will or the form that it will. Uh, but sure, that can be a worry. But I will tell you, I'm not I'm not well read on the particular issues of I, I have heard that that random X is quantum resistant in some way. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know about it enough to pontificate about it. So, OK, yeah, personally, I think it's a real threat, you know, for especially for Monero, because uh, oh, the connection is uh, OK, it's back. Well, I think it's a uh, it's a very um, it's a threat, especially for Monero. Because uh, for Monero, the specificity is about the, there is a tiny uncertainty about the supply because it is private, you know. So uh, I think, you know, there will be like a moment in history where we will have a quantum supremacy, but Monero needs to be quantum resistant before this arrives or before this becomes possible, you know. Because if, let's say, there are five years a duration like five years in, in which uh, quantum computers were good enough to break Monero cryptography, but Monero was not good enough you know, to um, to be quantum resistant, then there will be like uh, always a tiny like uh, doubt about the supply because there would be this moment in history where Monero was not completely quantum resistant. And yet, you know, the, the so potentially, like in, t in 10, 20 years, someone will say, well, there was this moment in history of five years, you know, where potentially someone had a quantum computers 
and broke the Monero cryptography and made, I don't know, uh, uncertain amount of Monero. So this is why I think Monero needs to be uh, quantum resistant in advance. Yeah, well, again, I, I don't know that much about the issue, but uh, okay. uh, I mean, I agree in, in principle, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So do do you want? To, do you still have time, or do you, because we have been talking about for for some time? Do you have uh, still some time uh, to to keep going, or? Yeah, yeah, I can I can still go. Uh, did you want to take a break or something? No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Just uh, asking now. Okay. All right. So so yeah, I, I think yeah we have made you know the point for for Monero and like we we have talked about a lot about uh, Bitcoin, you know, but yeah. Um, Personally, you know, like I don't want to focus too much on Bitcoin because I think that if Monero has to emerge, it will emerge by itself. You know, like we don't especially need, you know, to to like uh, to talk bad about Bitcoin because we we share, you know, most of our views with uh, Bitcoin my, of big people. But I th I think like the the slight differences is people overestimate how important it is, you know, and. Uh, in the coming years, I, I think like the difference between Bitcoin and Monero will be the same magnitude as the difference between the current system of fiat and Bitcoin. Now, I think, what do you think about it? Do you think like the step between the fiat system and Bitcoin is as huge as uh, the step between the Bitcoin and Monero? Or do you think it's uh, different? Um, I, I think that the issue between Bitcoin and Monero is what is actually going to work long term. Um, so, as I said, I, I don't know that the, if the Bitcoin network can actually persist in 200 years with the transaction fee problem. And, you know, th there are other issues. So that's the issue, w you know, for me. Um, and I do kind of feel like Bitcoin as time. I mean, really, this is already happening, as we've kind of talked about. Bitcoin is being normalized and applications are building being built on top of it that make it basically an index fund within the fiat currency system. Um, people are not really using it in the way that it's supposed to be used. So I, I think in the abstract, I would say there's a bigger gap between fiat and then crypto, including Bitcoin and Monero. But in practice, there might, you know, Bitcoin is kind of moving to be more like fiat. It's part of that system. Um, it's just, oh, it's something you invest in on a know your customer exchange more or less, as opposed to Monero, which is still trying to be a, a self-custodian uh, digital currency. I'll say you said that about, you know, Bitcoin versus, you know, talking about Bitcoin too much. I will just say when I say Bitcoin a lot of the times, I mean cryptocurrency, including Monero. I mean, realistically speaking, we're talking about the technological innovations that Bitcoin created that Monero, of course, maintains and probably maintains them in a, a pure essence. But um Either way, I, I do think that if we move to a harder currency as something used for saving and spending, that will fundamentally change the way that people live. Yeah, I mean, one thing about the inflationary Keynesian economy, right, is the fact that saving is not the default or, well, really saving is something that's difficult because your money is constantly being eaten by inflation, right? You save a hundred bucks it's going to be less later on, right? That, and that's something that everyone kind of understands intuitively. So however much we want to say, oh, save for the future, save for your kids, save blah, blah, blah. Saving is actually kind of a stupid thing if you're doing it in American dollars or any other. I mean, American dollars are actually probably the best fiat currency. <laughs> All the other ones are even worse. Actually, I say that you never know what's going to happen with the American dollar, you know, uh, especially because the American government is now just saying, oh, yeah. Uh, all these dollars that Russians hold, uh, they don't count anymore or something funny like that. Um, either way, uh, the thing about fiat currency is that it, it automatically breeds a consumerist, you know, economy because it's constantly losing value. So the marginal utility you get from spending now as opposed to later is going to be greater. You are going to find, oh, my goodness. Well, I might this. Hey, this $20 isn't going to be worth anything in 10 years. So I might as well buy this Funko Pop or, or something inane, you know, just something silly. Whereas one transformative thing about Bitcoin and Monero or any kind of any kind of hard currency, frankly, is the fact that it being scarce is going to basically cause it to 
uh, you expect it to appreciate in value, right? So if, if we have Monero and, you know, you, you get, let's say in the future, you get paid in Monero, you get that Monero. And so as time goes on, the price of Monero is going to be increasing. It's going to be more valuable as time goes on, as more wealth is being stored within the Monero network. That is necessarily what happens. Uh, you can actually say the same thing of gold, right? If more people are storing money in gold form, that in effect means the prices of gold is higher and vice versa, right? So when you have a hard money, saving is some, saving is like a really good financial decision to make. So if you save $100 in Bitcoin or Monero, you kind of expect that to be significantly more in five years, right? It might be astronomically higher. Um, and what that does is it totally changes human behavior in a way that a lot of people don't realize. But if you meet, you know, there, there was this old video on YouTube that's probably still there from a couple of years ago. You may have seen it where it's like, you know, the, the number one hodler. And it's like this Bitcoiner who lived in a tree house and he just had a bunch of mining rigs and he sold everything he owned to buy, you know, more cryptocurrency. <laughs> and now that's an insane example. Um, but what that produces in, you know, more normal people is people who say, who don't waste their money on consumption. Um, instead, they will save for the future. They'll say, listen, I've put a lot of work into getting this money and I can hold on to it. And in the same way that what I've done for the economy is going to increase in value over time, the money that I'm receiving is going to increase in value over time. So, yeah, I mean, there we, I mean, this is, I think this is like the most important thing, you know, because what it is about, it's about the, the time of the people, you know, I like to say giving back the freedom to the people, but actually it's giving the time back to the people, because if you're not able to store what you have done into an asset, that keeps value with time. It means that to some extent, you know, the system is robbing your time. And this is exactly what we have seen, you know, like people, they have to work for money. And on the other end, we have a system that can print money. So th this is why this is so important to have, uh, have assets and that can be resilient against the action of uh, governments. And I, I think the, uh, like with history, um, more and more people, will go into Monero because in the future, when you imagine people with like a high IQ, you know, they will want Monero because it is hard asset and because it has privacy. So yeah, giving back the time to the people, I truly think that it is central in everything, you know. And however hard people say cryptocurrency is, they'll always say, oh, it's, oh, how do I get Monero? How do I get Bitcoin? Blah, blah, blah. It's so much easier than the alternative within the economy that exists now, because if you want to store your value um, as it is now, usually what you do is you put it in stocks. Now, legally speaking and in terms of you know how you do that, that's a very difficult thing to do. Right. So you have to do it. You might have some brokerage or all this kind of stuff. And that's like a niche thing. That's a niche. Well, OK, around half of Americans have some amount of stocks, but it's not like the normal thing. You don't just. Oh, I'm, I'm going to, I got my paycheck. Let me put it all in stocks or something like that. Um, and a, a lot of Bitcoiners, actually, this is something that Michael Saylor says. You can give it whatever credence you think it deserves. But he does say that really the stock market should be considered the real index of inflation. Like his view is that if you have this, if the stock market goes up 10%, really that's all inflation. That's not necessary. Or maybe he said the S&P 500 or something like that. Uh, either way, there's not really growth happening in the economy. It's really just indexing the inflation, and that's the actual inflation rate. So if you want to avoid inflation and stay where you are and just tread water, well, you put money in stocks. Now, stocks are hard to get into. Uh, there, there are a bunch of legal things with them. And of course, however difficult it is to get Monero, it is much easier to get it and, and hold on to it and use it than it is to use stocks. Stocks are highly illiquid assets, right? So if you put money in stocks, oh man, it's it's hard. Oh, I got to sell them and then I got to pay capital gains tax, blah, 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 blah. Well, Monero, which is just digital cash uh, in a world where it's functioning as digital cash is it has all the goods of investing in stocks. And in fact, probably it's going to make better gains than the stock market, right? Most, even, even bad 
cryptocurrencies probably make bigger gains. Um, but it also is a, it is a highly liquid asset. You can send it to your bud if you own a, owe him money. You can buy something with it. You can, I don't know. So that's the point. It's, it's an asset that has all the benefits of traditional assets and currency um, and everything. It's, it's all bundled into one. Yeah. And I think, you know, it will play a central role in changing the relation between citizens and, and governments, you know. Because yeah, governments could barely exist without the fiat system, um, if at all. And especially the governments that we're familiar with, where you have this massive bureaucratic state that, I mean, the, the United States is the best example where it produces nothing. It doesn't really do anything compared to how much it consumes. And the only way that it can keep where it is, is with the fiat money system and the fact that U.S. dollars happen to be the consensus reserve currency, which might not be the case. Even, I mean, again, given what the United States is doing right now to Russians uh, just indiscriminately is a pretty good example of why the, the, why the dollar might not be a reserve currency in 10 years even. Yeah. Can you can you go further on this? You think like uh, in, in some years, like uh, the dollar will lose its status as a reserve currency in the world and, and then I mean, currency will replace it, you know. Um, it's hard to. I mean, if you're if you're asking a fiat currency, I I don't think that it's Monero or Bitcoin's time to shine just yet. Uh, in that, like in the next ten years, we well, I don't know. Bitcoin's been around for ten years, so you never know what the next ten years is gonna ha have. You have no clue. Um, Monero the same way. Monero might even be more. I mean, all these issues of scalability and stuff like that that we've spoken about. They might be resolved at some point. Um, so it's hard to say. I think that we're moving, politically speaking, to a more unipolar or multi, uh, polypolar, multipolar world, right? Where it, in the post-war era, it was kind of just America. And there was a brief Cold War between it and the Soviet Union. And since then, it's been kind of America in the lead with the dollar. The dollar has been the reserve currency for the entire period there. Um but it, it's hard to say what's going to happen next. I don't think the, the thing like Russia and China, none of these countries, I think, are big enough that their currencies are going to be the reserve currency. So we might we might go ahead and move to something digital. Um, and that could mean I mean, right now, that probably means Bitcoin, because that's the one that normies know about. But there is a possibility if there is a decent coin out there. And this is, you know, within the next 20 years or so. Um, like Monero, it might be an option for a, a kind of reserve currency. But uh, with the added addendum that governments, I mean, no government is necessarily going to like a currency that they can't control. Um, there are big benefits, obviously. Like right now, the Russians are probably wishing that they were using Monero already, right? Yeah. <laughs> because of all the, the silly, I mean, it's actually, I mean, this is kind of irrelevant to what we're talking about. Well, it is, no, it is relevant, actually. Um, I've been very surprised about the systematic, uh, I guess, deplatforming of the entire nation of Russia, and not just the not just the Russian government, mind you, but the people of Russia. I mean, American companies like Google and Apple and Facebook and um, GitHub and all of these uh, Microsoft are all coming out and just like canceling services to the entire nation of Russia, which I think highlights how stupid it is for people to rely on platforms that are out of their control and fiat currency and digital currencies that are not truly peer-to-peer -peer are examples of that. You don't want to be reliant on the fiat currency system. Uh, and that's true of software as well. I mean, um, you should be using free and open source software. Any, you know, if you're using Microsoft Windows, that's an inherent, that's an inherent vulnerability, right? I would consider any seed phrase that touches Microsoft Windows to be compromised, you know? Um, so I, I think that, uh, uh, I think this is telling people why they need to do things right. And why, if we're moving to a new reserve currency or we're new, moving to a new standard, it really has to be an open and private and encrypted system if it is going to be digital. That is basically mandatory. And that is something that really, all parties can agree to, even though right now the United States government is kind of calling the shots in the traditional financial system. But really, everyone else can sit down and say, listen, it might be to my disadvantage to adopt a hard currency. 
uh, you know, in the sense that I can't inflate it for a reserve currency. Um, but th there are big benefits for everyone in that. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about a model maybe like the government that will hold a cryptocurrency as a hard asset? And then um, for the people, you know, like a kind of a fiat, but backed by like a digital currency that could be backed by a hard asset, you know. What do you think, I mean, about that potentially? Like the government, maybe they want to hold a cryptocurrency like Monero, but maybe they don't want it to be the national currency. So do you, how do you think it can happen, you know? It, I think it's impossible to say. I will say that, um, I, I mean, one, one thing that I think in the future we will have, so right now, one critique that people will make of, you know, cryptocurrency is the fact that, oh my goodness, prices are volatile, right? Or, oh, oh my goodness, Bitcoins are, are worth so much and it's hard to denominate. You know, if you, if you buy like a sandwich in Bitcoin, it's, you know, what, like 0 .00 or something, you know, it's some weird looking number. Um, and of course, all cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Monero included, are, are pretty volatile. Um, not as volatile as people think, uh, really, but um, they're, they're volatile. Um, but one thing that I think has happened over the past couple of years is even people who use cryptocurrencies are still denominating most stuff in American dollars or in local currencies. And that's not really a problem because obviously cryptocurrency is based on software. Uh, it's it's inherently digital and it's the easiest thing in the world to just, oh, let me check the conversion rate now. Give people, you know, a 20, let's say this thing you buy online is $20. Well, we can easily have this thing, check a site and get the amount of Monero that that is worth and charge people that amount of Monero, right? Mm -hmm. So I think for the time being, I kind of see familiar things like the American dollars uh, persisting provided there's no hyperinflation, but I think that it will probably persist as just a way of denominating value because people find it a little unintuitive. Um, and so I think in that respect, I see it persisting, but in the future, I mean, it, it would be nice for me to hope that whatever physical currencies we have, you know, they're based on hard money, they're based on gold or silver or something like that. I don't know how likely that is, The nice thing with cryptocurrency is that the revolution, governments do not have to consent to it, right? They don't have to say, we are going to adopt this as legal tender. It can just be something that gradually happens and gradually increases in usefulness. But we've already seen, I mean, obviously, El Salvador is accepting Bitcoin um, as legal tender. And I said there are many bad things about what's going on specifically in El Salvador. But that is something that we could imagine happen in other countries. But additionally, even in the United States, I don't know if you've seen this, but there have been many states that have said they're now interested in accepting fees and taxes in cryptocurrencies and not just Bitcoin, but Ethereum, maybe Monero. Right. So this is a big thing. I think this is something that we're now I don't think any state has already done that, but they're talking about it. I know that the governor of Florida has said something like it'd be cool if people could pay like their vehicle registrations. No. I think we'll have a gradual well, what's that? Yeah, the connection is not it's back, it's okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um I don't know if you missed anything important, but uh no, yeah, I, so I, I think I have we, are, okay. we are having um smaller parties and governments already starting to say, hey, this is interesting stuff, and they're probably thinking, obviously, oh, I can make money, you know, you, you are since the American dollar is going to be worth zero eventually. You are going to be make money, making money by storing what you would otherwise have in dollars in cryptocurrency, pretty much by definition. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something I think we can expect to have marginal improvements in. Yeah, but I, I don't even know if they realize what they are doing, you know, because the moment like it's possible to pay you taxes with a crypto, I mean, oh, it's so okay, now it's back. Yeah, the moment it's possible, you know, to pay your taxes with uh, crypto. Well, Bitcoin, I mean, uh, the dollar really becomes irrelevant and useless, you know, like, I don't even know what people will still hold some dollars or fiat national currency if it's possible to pay your taxes in crypto, you know. So maybe... Yeah, uh, well, yeah. I will go ahead and say 
I will tell you who is still going to pay their taxes in fiat. I am because yeah. by mere virtue of Gresham's law, right? So if you have the choice of, let's say you have a tax bill from the government, oh, 10,000 bucks. Are you going to part with $10,000 of Monero to pay that? Or are you going to pay with your paper, paper currency that's backed by literally nothing? Um, and the reality is you better pay with that paper currency because you know it's going to go nowhere. So, you know, American dollars are still going to be there. Um, they're just going to be, we're going to accelerate their uselessness as people are using them more. And, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the irony of it, that people are not going to use cryptocurrencies for a lot of things precisely because they are so good at what they do. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons that there are reasons to have like multiple currencies. And in our case, it might be the case that the American dollar might be some vestigial organ that people use to just pay for things quickly because they know it's like not really worth things. Yeah, very interesting. And so you envision a future where there will be like several cryptocurrencies? You, you're talking about a multi-cryptocurrency landscape? Or do you think like there will be one that will be the major cryptocurrency? So as I said at the beginning of the video, I'm kind of a maximalist when it comes to things because my way of looking at them are that really you just want one system that they're all based on that has you know principles behind it and everyone is in the same network right so if we're monero people and we want to transact with some other guy out there but he likes bitcoin cash okay that's an issue whereas um if we're all on the same page i mean that's the point of currency currency is useful because you expect other people will will uh, take it in so there's an inherent there's an inherent purpose of there being one chain to rule them all right so mm -hmm. right now now I, I did say as well that you can of course write software on top of things like bitcoin and ethereum um you can also not really write software on top of monero monero doesn't really have smart contracting abilities it, it might have something super simple but it doesn't even have what bitcoin has and now that's for a reason of course that's because when as monero began um, there was no private way to do uh, smart contracting whatsoever. It's something that compromises privacy. But I think again, with the, the you know now that we have, there's more complex uh, cryptocurrency uh, or crypto technology which can feasibly have smart contracting um, in a private fashion. And if that is the case, I think it's really mandatory in effect that once we can vet that technology, it really needs to be built into Monero or whatever currency is going to be used. Because in that case, we can have a private currency and we can have a private currency that you can build complex programs and applications on top of. Layer twos that of course are not doing the basic currency function. That's not what I'm saying. Um, Monero still does the basic currency function, but you can write things on top of that that do things that are far more complex if you need it. So that that is something that I, I so ideally I would like us to be in a place where we only need one chain, um, but there with a couple caveats. One is I don't necessarily think that will happen. I think that we will have multiple chains. I expect Bitcoin to persist, right? Um, and additionally, I do not want digital things to be mandatory. Um, I would like I do not want to live in a world where I have to pay with everything, even with Monero. I want to be able to pay with something physical. I want to be able to pay with something where I know that there is not going to be any metadata leakage because there's no metadata. I want to be able to give someone a silver coin. So I, I do want us to always have that ability to not use technology. That is actually most important for me. Um, but, you know, in the realm of digital technology, we got to do it right. And that's what. Yeah. Is. But why would why would it uh, be so important, you know? If it's possible to, I mean, to to exchange with uh, digital cryptocurrencies, because when you think about it, you know, like silver and gold in the universe, they are ubiquitous. You know, like uh, they are everywhere. So when the when humans, you know, they are going to start to go on Mars and on the universe. So basically, gold and silver, it will be everywhere. So personally, I think that having digital scarcity is a uh, it, it is a milestone. And that uh, in the future, it will become the norm, you know. Well, I, I don't know how much I buy the whole ast asteroid mining thing. I mean, maybe that's a thing. I mean, that's if, real. If, if, this is huge. Well, okay, if it, okay, I'm skeptical of the extent to which it could be feasible. And either way, the point is not gold or silver or whatever themselves 
but some kind of physical non-digital currency. I think that's mandatory. And the reason I say that is, let's say you use some great, let's say Monero is the greatest thing ever. It's perfectly just, just private. Thing, just one thing, <laughs> breaking news, breaking news. One day I will build like a company <laughs> with uh, some Monero, you know, I will fund a company that is going to uh, mine some, uh, <laughs> some asteroids. <laughs> Okay. All right. Just, Good uh, to know. Just yes. Um, but just the reason, you know, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, but the reason I say you have to have something non-digital. Okay. Absolutely, one thousand percent. You have to have that. Um, is because I, when I look at why I endorse Monero, it is primarily because of dystopia avoidance. I do not want to live in a dystopia. Okay. So let's say Monero is the greatest currency ever. It's it's perfectly scalable. It's perfectly private. Everything's fantastic about it. Well, here's the thing. I want to be able to buy something without taking my freaking phone to the store or without getting microchipped with my Monero wallet and some you know fancy transaction. I don't care how perfect it is. I do not want to have to use so I do not want to have to use some kind of digital technology where I could just give someone a coin. Yeah, I see what you mean. But um the way things go, you know, I think like everything is going to become digital, you know? So for me, um, yeah, I think like the, the cash and uh, the coins, they, they will disappear with time, you know? So this is why having digital cash is so important. Um, well, I definitely do not think, uh, no, I don't think that everything is going to be digital. Like there are inherent, I mean, okay. There are inherent difficulties, even if you don't care about privacy, now, firstly, carrying a cell phone on you is necessarily a privacy liability, even if you are running Monero and stuff like that. So that in itself, I think, is questionable. Um, mm -hmm. But even aside from that, I want to be able to, tra to transact value um, where there's no metadata leakage, where I might not necessarily have Internet connection, where I can physically hold things, because there are times that you need to physically hold something. Um, and like there are many reasons to use a physical... Um, physical currency. And I absolutely don't think that everything is going to be digital. I think the worst thing in the world is the fact when people are digitizing things that don't need to be digitized. Like there are many reasons to use digital technology. There's of course many reasons to use digital currency, but I don't think that it's going to be the only standard. And I think it's very dangerous. I mean, any, any of this metaverse stuff, I think is probably a great example of Things that I, I mean, people are literally create, trying to create this universe to replace the real universe. Um, yeah. I, I view that as inherently questionable. And um, uh, you always have to have that real, like, and if I were given a choice, mind you, if I were given a choice of us using all physical coins or using Monero, I would absolutely choose physical coins because you have to have that, I mean, you you have to not be able to use technology. I don't want to force people into using extra layers of complexity. That's actually the whole point of me making the argument as for why we don't need layer two, we should have good digital technology. In the same way, I do not want to force people to have to use this technology to transact value. And that's in essence what you're doing if you're saying everything is going to be digital. Yeah, I mean, I don't buy into the metaverse thing, you know, but when it comes to like, uh, money, I, I think like um, it will be like impossible to have uh, something material that will store value because on the universe everything is ubiquitous, you know. And um, in the coming years, I think like uh, humans they are going to go into the universe. So what will happen that well everything let's say you, like you think like everything that is scarce on Earth is going to be there are going to be plenty on the universe. So once people start to go in the universe, I think like the only scarcity that will be left is uh, digital scarcity. No. Uh, I am just less, I have less faith in our technological system. I, I don't really even think, <laughs> I, at this point, I doubt that people are even going to put a man on Mars, frankly. So, so uh, <laughs> I, that, that's possible. I, I, I just don't. I think that requires a whole lot of faith in the technology to say that, oh, we're going to be able to asteroid mine things and stuff in the, in very soon in the future. I think that's kind of a big leap. And if, if that does happen, if it comes out in the next years that we're going to be imminently doing that kind of stuff, I mean, I'll make adjustments. I just find that very, very unlikely. I think there's a tendency to say, oh, in principle, we can do this with technology. 
therefore it could happen. Like space is a very big place. You might say there's a lot of gold and silver in the universe, and that's very true, I'm sure. Um, but space is also an astronomically large place. It's hard to move places. It's hard to do everything, doing everything in space. I mean, it, it sort of reminds me of the people who, the kind of nutters who are like, whoa, man, we're killing the planet with global warming. So let's just move to Mars and terraform it because that'll be easier. And that's insane. Uh, dealing with like an increase in the Earth's temperature of a couple degrees is infinitely easier than going to Mars and terraforming a planet. And I think a lot of people, when they're talking about space futurism, they have this tendency to omit a lot of the zeros. I think they underestimate how difficult a lot of things are going to be. Um, and that's just like, given the things we know, given the things we don't know, a lot of this stuff is probably going to be impossible, a physically impossible given physics and the way that we understand it. So, but all of this is immaterial. I mean, there is probably just some... I just want to buy stuff with physical stuff. I mean, that that's what I want. And I might use, I mean, in real, like right now, I, I don't have any cash in my wallet right now. I use, uh, you know, credit cards or whatever to transact most of my stuff. However, I still want that right to use cash. And I might in the future be using, and, and I fully expect 99% of transactions in a hundred years from now, barring, you know, uh, some kind of huge technological collapse, I expect 99% of transactions to be digital, but we always have to write the right, have to have the right to not do digital transactions. Okay, I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> if uh, only an existing possibility, like an option. Yeah, I see what you mean. In this way, I agree. Yes. Like uh, if uh, there is only the digital thing and like we cannot do something else, like it does have to be mandatory, you know, but I think it will be like the main thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, another possibility, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't say this before, but um, another possibility for physical currency, let's say that your disaster scenario, or maybe you don't consider a disaster, but the scenario of, let's say, gold and silver are just falling from the sky now. We have so much of it. Well, you can do a physical currency based on a digital currency, right? So you could have a trusted bank that says, okay, we have reserves, we have 1 million Monero in our vaults. And you can deposit your Monero and we will give you, we will give you paper Monero. All right. So and we can verify cryptographically that your paper Monero corresponds to Monero that we actually have. We're not doing fractional reserve banking. You could do something like that. And then you could use your paper Monero without your, your cell phone or anything. That would work fine. So that's a possibility as well. Um, but again, I just I just have to you have to have the ability to give someone directly something without the internet or any of that crap. That's all I'm saying. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And what you said, I think you just uh, made the picture, you know, for what will potentially happen in the future, which is like cryptocurrencies from uh, governments that are cryptographically linked to a store value like Monero, you know. And when, when we talked about it, like we said that, a government, they don't necessarily really want Monero for their population because they cannot track everything and all of this. But maybe like they will have Monero as store of value and a fiat currency, but linked to their store value uh, cryptographically so that they cannot inflate the money. I think that uh, this is a very possible way, you know, and uh, likely future, you know, the way governments are going to... Well, I think if you're linking a fiat currency to a digital asset, it ceases being a fiat currency. Yes, it ceases. It's, it's not it's a fiat currency. Right? from right? government, you know. So, so yeah. From government. Yeah. Um, what was that? I didn't hear that. Yeah, it would be like have money, but from the government, you know, it's, um, it would be right. like a possibility, you know. Yeah. And, you know, one thing about it is, is that hopefully I think what will happen is a kind of peaceful – revolution or, or transfer over to cryptocurrency more. Um, because as, as I said, there are some governments, not all governments are necessarily antithetical to Bitcoin. Um, uh, obviously, I mentioned a, a bunch of US states have thought about accepting Bitcoin or Monero or, or, or other cryptocurrencies. So a lot of basically everyone out there, except for the Fed, has some reason to use this stuff. It's only the Fed and the, its beneficiaries that are going to be like, oh, I don't know about this. Like, this is a little, we won't, we won't have the power we used to have. Um, and I think that mass adoption is something that can ha happen, happen gradually. I mean, I, I hope that it, 
um, you know, I guess it's kind of our job to help make things a little easier for people. Um, that's why, you know, when I recommend people to get into cryptocurrency, I never do it because I want them to expect to make money because that's literally not what it's about. Um, the way, you know, if I'm trying to sell Monero to someone, I will just say it's a nice way of exchanging value digitally. You don't have to rely on PayPal. You don't have to pay all these massive transaction fees. You don't have to do all this other silliness. Uh, you don't have to have a platform. It, and, you know, I recommend people just to get into it, buy a couple hundred, couple thousand dollars of it just to and, and tell your friends to do it, too. And when you owe each other money, send money back. Or, or if you want to buy something from the other, do that. And then once you have a small community of people doing that, you move on to, oh, can we get the businesses in our town to accept Monero or something like that? Like that's how adoption really happens. It doesn't happen by people making money and then posting on social media how much money they made, you know? Yeah. Yeah, really like um, making sure you know, that people use it. You know, this is where everything happens. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and that's, one of the reasons that I think Bitcoin is going to be lagging in respects to Monero, um, you know, Monero, I forget the exact metric right now, but I think it's around a tenth of Bitcoin's transactions, which is like way more than you expect, considering like the market cap and everything. You expect it to be far less. Monero is actually used like like people actually use Monero, whereas if you look a couple of years back, you know, it was like two percent of Bitcoin's transactions. So it's. It's much more significant and it's not like one spike. It's a pretty consistent, you know, usage pattern. So I think it, that it, it's definitely a slow burn. And again, I, I don't I don't recommend it to people because I want, the, you know, well, I do want them to make money, but that's not the reason I, I recommend uh, using this stuff. It's really just the way people should look at it is it's software. It is software that does something that no other software does. And it's something that can be very, very useful for you and your friends and businesses around you and everyone else. Yeah. And as governments, you know, they are going to become crazier and crazier, you know. Uh, we have seen this with um, the recent events, with uh, Wishua and fine, with everything. And what I believe is that now it will become mandatory to have a protection against the actions of governments. Because we have seen, like, uh, they, they can inflate the money and then they can overtax people. So... I, I truly believe that right now the situation is going to become more and more extreme because just like two or three years ago, like nobody even knew what a central bank is, you know. And right now, like yeah. central banks, everyone knows about it. And the central bankers, everyone know them. So the, the situation is completely changing. And uh, if you remember, like at one point, there was uh, this, uh, this woman, I think it's... Uh, Omar, uh, Omarova, like a, a communism, a communist that uh, tried to take uh, the lead of um, an agency of uh, the United States. And basically, she proposed some uh, communist measures for the whole country and to completely like erase banks and make uh, them um, like uh, replace banks with a central bank. And what I think is uh, it was uh, like a, a test. To, to test people of what is possible uh, before they actually do something like this, you know. And in the coming years, it's not coming right now, but like in coming years, they will propose measures that are so crazy that if you're not protected, you will be like uh, completely uh, robbed, you know. Yeah, the issue particularly with the American government is that it's really, I don't want to say it's overplayed its hand because it might still work out for it, but... I mean, a lot of people look at governments and have this idea that there are there are nice governments and then there are totalitarian governments. And there are these two boxes. Right. And during the 50s and 60s and 70s, 80s, a lot of Americans are like, oh, well, we, we definitely have a nice government. But in reality, when you have a system that big, a nice government is just a government that doesn't feel threatened. And the American government feels threatened now. And this is why we've had this expansion. I mean, of course, we have inflation like that's been happening, but it's continuing. But we've had these massive lockdowns, this massive uh, attempt to persecute protesters and things like this uh, here and in Canada and in Europe and Australia. All of these countries are are kind of panicking because they can see that they are they're in a threat. I mean, in the United States, the the 
the starting starting point of this was sort of Donald Trump, who's a doofus, but like um, he kind of uh, he they realized that he the fact that he can get so many people behind him and a lot of people are so upset with the system, right? They are just you know there's a reason for them to actually clamp down on people. That's when things kind of began here. People started getting deplatformed by stuff uh, by different platforms. And now it's expanded beyond particular politics. It's getting wider and wider and wider. And the American government and really the governmental system, we shouldn't really just talk about the American government, but, you know, the American government, the Fed, uh, kind of the media and university class of people who are all kind of on the same page. All of them are panicked, um, not just about the money, but now, you know, now the new thing is Russia, right? So Russia, of course, is no... A threat to the United States militarily, um, but it's it's kind of become become this new impetus for people to jump off. I mean, they're, they're applying the new next level of censorship to Russia now, financial censor, censorship, um, all the kind of thing. The president of the United States come at, came out and said, "Well, you know, it's on the table. We might just start expropriating Russians living in America. We might just take their property." Oh, those oligarchs, we got to stop them. I mean, that's something that the United States would accuse Venezuela of doing. Oh, my God, this is like third world behavior. I can't, you're just, you, you just want to take people's property. And so what all of this has to do with cryptocurrency is not just the inflation aspect. That is definitely like you, if you take away the ability to inflate the currency, that takes away a lot of their power. But additionally, cryptocurrency is the first kind of money that is, is so magical you can store it in your brain if you memorize your seed phrase. It's mm -hmm. not something that's sitting in a bank account that the American government has control over, or they can say, oh, well, you better stop working with this bank or we'll take your money or we'll freeze your account or something like that. So now we see all of these reasons just to use, I mean, to use, if we're using a digital technology, we have to have a private one and one that where a person has custodianship over his own money. Yeah, completely, completely. This is like, I mean, <laughs> the, the difference, you know, between having your own money and letting your money to the government or any other institution, you know, this is a difference between being truly free and to be like a sovereign citizen, you know, and being a slave, you know, because I have to use the, the words. I think the current system we have, it's more and more a slavery system, you know, where we have yeah. the, the debt system. We have talked about inflation and it comes with uh, the debt of people, you know, who, you know, they, they have to work for money. So it means that if people can inflate money, they, it makes them slaves, you know. And f for me, I, I think like cryptocurrency and especially Monero, it's uh, giving to the people a way to escape from this uh, crazy system. And yes, yeah, um, I think like in coming years, there will be a government, you know, that will say that it is illegal to have Monero. And I will try to, 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 to go out against Monero, but it would be impossible to do anything, you know. So right now we are seeing like um, all the leaders of countries that are showing exactly all the points why cryptocurrency is important and also why Bitcoin is not relevant, is not up to the job compared to Monero. You know, because if uh, some people from Canada, for instance, you know, if they use Bitcoin, they can be tracked. So it means that it's, uh, it's useless, you know, for the use case. So right now, I think like we are at a very critical moment where every cryptocurrency is like tested, you know, on its fundamentals. So that's why the, the price doesn't matter, because right now every cryptocurrency is, is uh, tested on the fundamentals. And what will arrive in coming years is that uh, the properties of Monero will make it emerge from, uh, from the, dark, uh, <laughs> the dark spot where it is right now. You know. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the reasons why Monero is so much more important than Bitcoin, because Monero does everything right on the base layer. It is right by default. You don't have to add stuff on top of it. And as we mentioned earlier in the stream, um, Bitcoin, as it's being implemented in El Salvador, is exactly the opposite of what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be peer-to-peer. -peer, it's supposed to be non-custodial. 
It's supposed to be pseudo anonymous. And again, what's the El Salvadorian government doing? Well, you log on to their app, you give your name, your address, and all this kind of stuff. You take a picture of yourself. Humiliating. I've always found that humiliating. But then they give you a custodial wallet, ultimately, that the government controls. This is, I mean, it's more absurd than the banking system as it is right now. I mean, I trust a bank more with my money than I do the government. I do not want them to have uh, my money and say, oh, my goodness, that it, anytime we want, we could take it away. And, of course, in El Salvador, it's even worse than that. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Because the El Salvadorian government, you might know, uses this kind of custodianship service for their private keys. There's actually an American company that ha allegedly, I mean, this has been partially verified, but there's an American company that has custodianship, that does their custodianship for the Bitcoin that the uh, El Salvadorian government has from its people. So people are now logging into this Panopticon program, program where all their transactions are watched. Their transactions can be easily monitored and censored. Um, they, their personal, they are KYC'd up the wazoo. This is the exact opposite of what a cryptocurrency is mm -hmm. supposed to be. And again, this is Bitcoin's first appearance on the global stage, and it's a freaking disaster. And this is why Monero is so important, important because you don't have to build layer two on top of Monero. You don't have to build this other crap. It just works. Even if you have no clue how it works, it works. You get an app on your phone. You hide your seed phrase in a nice and secure place. You put money on Monero and it, you can transact it. And you don't have to worry about anything. It's uncensorable. It's unmonitorable. It does what a currency is supposed to do. And again, it's an issue of do you want to build your house on the sand or do you want to build your house on a rock? And Monero is built on that rock. Bitcoin, maybe the house on sand can last for a while. Maybe it'll last forever. But I don't want to live in a house there. I would rather, rather live on a rock, you know? Yeah. Because if, you know, if we have to, when, when you, I mean, what you just said, you know, about the private keys and the fact that the government of El Salvador, they don't even have their own private keys. I mean that's so crazy, and I didn't I didn't even know about it, you know. And yeah, well, we're, we're, well I'll go ahead and say it's not even totally sure. Like they might have some multi-signature uh, wallet or something like that. Either way, some American company, which is beholden to the American government, has at least partial control over the money. So, <laughs> okay. So I think you know in the coming uh, years, what will happen? The debate it will also be like custodial against non-custodial and the fact that Bitcoin right now it is creating a, an ecosystem where it becomes more and more custodial you know and uh, there was also this uh, new norm I think it's called AOP something like this and oh, I don't yeah. know if you I don't know if you know but like the wallet um, like uh, I think it was Trezor wallet and other major wallets like they have implemented this without telling anybody so basically what it did is like it uh, linked the identity of the owner to addresses and it tracked well, the transactions and everything. And well, nobody knew about it, but uh, then it was linked and uh, they decided to, to stop it. But I think it is just a question of time before they, they go back and implement such uh, things. And right now, I think like Monero with uh, Avno, it is creating like a decentralized ecosystem and uh, this is extremely important, you know, like it will not only be privacy against uh, transparent uh, money, but it will also be like a decentralized ecosystem against custodial with rules and government's ecosystem. Yeah. And, and this, I said earlier that regulation, although I don't want cryptocurrency to be regulated, but I do think regulation is going to work in our benefit because, yeah, can you know, you, what, uh, yeah, can we, you we, can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, what is happening is like people are being nudged more and more to just using cryptocurrency in the way that it's intended, using a peer to peer exchange like Haveno or which I don't think is out yet, but, you know, BISC or something like that for Bitcoin, which, of course, you can get Monero on, too. Um, so like that is going to push people in the right way. And the, the other thing you have to remember, as I said before, having holding Monero or using Monero or having a Monero ecosystem is not about cashing in and cashing out. That's one of the big hurdles that normies have when they get into cryptocurrency. The thing you have to emphasize to them 
is that you are buying into a system that is going to be inherently valuable. You are going to be able to transact that value on the system. And yes, in American dollars, your, your money's going up. But the important thing to remember is you don't cash out. You want to be in this new economy that has, uh, you know, doesn't have very much now. You can't do that. I mean, you can do lots of things with Monero and stuff, but realistically speaking, you can't, you know, do everything you do daily, right? Um, but we we want to move to a place where there are networking effects such that people want to accept this currency and it has all of these benefits. That that is the goal. Like people need to stop thinking about making money off of it and need to start thinking of using this network for what it's supposed to be. Oh yeah, okay, it's, it's back. So yeah, uh, just a few questions, you know, about uh, like it's not directly related to, to Monero, you know, because sure. um, yeah, on, on your channel, you know, I, I saw that uh, you're willing to Latin and uh, also you were talking about a book, you know, and it seemed uh, very interesting. It's uh, from Aristotle. Uh, secret of secret, secret room. Oh yeah, secretum secretorum. Uh, yeah, that's it. Or secret <laughs> secrets in English. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah, I mean, if if people don't know, I assume those who watch my channel will know. But uh, one one thing that I've always been interested in is republishing out of print books. So I started that last year. I have a little business that's LindyPress.net, uh, which actually does not accept Monero yet. That's my goal this year. It, there was a period. Actually, let me let's talk about Monero being used. There was a per period where I started my website when I did accept cryptocurrency payments. Uh, I'm actually trying to use BTC pay and more non-custodial stuff, doing things the right way now. But uh, there was a period where I did accept cryptocurrency payments um, and I accepted Bitcoin, Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, Ethereum and Monero. And I will go ahead and tell you, I, I just had that for a week or two, but more than 50% of the payments that I got were from Monero, okay? There are one or two from Ethereum. I think there was maybe one or two from Bitcoin and zero over the Lightning Network. So that'll just tell you, you know, in terms of usage, where usage is at. Um, either way, so I have a, a little site called lindypress.net. And what I do is I take books that have been out of print and, and reprint them. Um, and it it's all using, it, you know, this printing service and it's print on demand, basically. Um, so, yeah, I, I like taking books, especially from... Uh, I have five books that are up there as we're recording this, and I have a couple others that I'm working on that one included. Um, you know, so I just make books uh, that have, you know, not been in print, put things in them. Um, is there anything specifically about that book that you wanted to talk about or? No, because when you, I mean, it, it seemed like uh, you were talking about Aristotle and uh, Alexander the Great, and it seemed, uh, what you said about it, it seemed very interesting, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the book, The Secret of Secrets, yeah. firstly, modern scholars will say, oh, it wasn't actually written by Aristotle, like that's unlikely or something like that. Either way, people at the period uh, definitely believe that Aristotle did write this book. It was massively influential in the Middle Ages. And it's an interesting book, just as a casual reading thing. That's one of the, it, it was very influential, but it, it also is a good casual read because it's really Aristotle giving Alexander the Great all of this kind of life advice. Right. So a lot of it is specifically political. Um, so it's telling him how to how to choose ministers, how to run a society, how to win wars. But it also has things like, well, you know, what how, how do you wake up in the morning? What's a good morning routine? What, what should you eat? What seasons should you eat different things in? If you feel like this, you know, all this kind of dietary stuff. And it even has things that are are more like um, herbal remedies and and even some kind of esoteric stuff. There's a there's a recipe for the philosopher's stone. So it's just an interesting book culturally speaking, and it's one of those books that um, again was massively important at the time and and uh, affected a lot of thinking. But modern people actually don't know that it exists anymore because I think the modern tendency is to say, well, they say Aristotle didn't actually write this. So let's just kind of ignore it. So it's not not it's not a real book. And in reality, it was probably more important than a lot of other stuff that Aristotle had written. Um, okay. But okay. So another one I'll have that I'll, actually I think I have a copy right here um, that I did. Um, 
that kind of reminds me of it. But a, another book that was massively influential that I reprinted was uh, the book of etymologies. Now, this book oh, is actually in it, Latin. Yeah. So when you print it, like you put uh, all this, uh, I mean, you put like it's uh, like it's professional, like uh, you have all the equipment and all of this to do that. So yeah. I use a print on demand company, which is something that's similar to, Am you know, Amazon does this if you want to publish your own book. You know, you can send a PDF of it to Amazon and they'll, they'll print it. Okay, so it's not me that does the printing or shipping. It's actually a company called Lulu. I, I, I'm anti-Amazon. I'm not going to use them. I could probably make more money using Amazon. But um, either way, so what I do specifically is, um, well, one thing that I've done on my channel for a while um, is uh, typeset documents. So, you know, to, making a book, of course, is way more complicated than people think. Uh, I don't use like Microsoft Word. I use a uh, technology that's called LaTeX or, or Zellatech, uh, which is a way of basically automatically form uh, formatting documents and it can add images and other things in. It'll number all your pages. It'll cross reference everything. Um, so that's the software that I use to write this stuff. And it basically has uh, templates for creating in books and stuff. And it's all on the command line and, and, and you know, I use on my computer. I don't know if you've seen my screencast. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So either way, what you get is a very nice looking book, um, you know, in terms of like if you open it up, it is it is very well formatted. And, uh, you know, I, I spend a good bit of time, you know, dealing with the sizes and stuff like that. So that's that's one way I have. That's the kind of business I've had that I actually I've always wanted to do just for myself. But, yeah. OK, it, it looks uh, very interesting, you know, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, well, I think yeah, we have uh, we have done a lot, you know. Uh, just you no, know, just out of curiosity, you know. Uh, I don't know if you know, but I'm working right now, you know, on a, a blockchain project, you know, for open source medical research uh, with that intellectual property, you know. And uh, well, it's a HK project, and um, I wanted you know to because I know that you're not into Web three and all of this. Personally, I'm not in Web three as well, but like uh, I think. Uh, there is a necessity, you know, for a blockchain that will enable us to have uh, open source medical research. So I wanted to know, you know, if uh, you already know something about it or what is your point of view, you know, about that? Um, I'm not familiar with that particular project. Um, uh, of course, I am. I mean, the, the main problem with pretty much anything academic is, of course, the copyrights at this point. Like there are a bunch of really absurd hoops you have to jump through to read certain documents and documents that would actually benefit everyone out there. Um, and to me, it's always been kind of sick that copyrights even exist, right? Um, like there, there's kind of a greedy justification for them, but I've always had like I'm a I'm an efficiency man, and when I write software, I want things to be free and open source. And the reason I want that is because my view, like I do not want to. Um, extract money from the software itself. I want to live in an environment where you have interacting software that is collaboratively written and people can build stuff on top of, right? And that's mm -hmm. actually what Monero is. That's what Bitcoin is. That's what they're trying to do. If It wouldn't be worth anything if it were a proprietary, you know, closed source program. Um, so I'm a big, I, you know, I'm a big proponent of copyleft and uh, just in general, the, the idea that copyright should be subverted. So, I mean, that... That that's a good. Um, I mean, I consider that good. I don't know how ne necessary it is to do it over the blockchain. Uh, there has been a move in academia, just out of the sheer annoyance of it. There have been, you know, many open source, open access journals that have arisen, or places where you can just publish scientific papers. And I am very much anti uh, uh, the university system and a lot of the research systems out there are fundamentally and radically corrupt. Um, they're, they are focused on so much else other than what they are nominally supposed to be doing. And one of the reasons is they are trying to squeeze money out of something which should inherently be done for either academic interests or for you know wanting to do good. And I feel like a lot of people are less focused on that and more focused on being functionaries within academia, unfortunately. Uh, but nonetheless, I think there is somewhat of a movement to have more ac open access journals. Um, now, I, I don't know what your project is on or what the blockchain there does, but I, I don't know. Is, is there some particular reason a, 
a blockchain has to be used or, or something like that? Yeah, actually, you know, um, when you talk about the open journals, this is exactly, you know, about this. But like um, the blockchain, I think, is necessary to create the incentive because right now, like the reason why there is nobody making like open source medical research is because like there is no incentive to do that. And when I say this, I mean an economic incentive. Uh, and with blockchain, we can create um, a protocol that can reward people that make open source uh, medical research. And uh, that's, that's why, you know, I think uh, blockchain is necessary. So, yeah, if you if you want, you can check out you know, the HK uh, HK project. Um, I, I think the potential, you no, know, it's uh, absolutely uh, huge. And um, I've been working on this, you know, for for years now, and it's going to launch uh, like in the coming days. So, and okay. yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I'll just say I'm kind of an idealist about things like that because. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, the economic incentive, I'm sure that's great. And I, I, I hope it works out. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, in it, it, you know, working in the world of free and open source software, right? We've yeah. written entire operating systems ground up multiple times with um, a panoply of suite of software, all without that economic motivation. So I'm saying I'm, I'm idealist in the sense that I think in a lot of cases, um, or maybe this is just how I am. Like, I really feel that um i don't know like I, I just i feel like it's not real if it's not free and open source you know what i mean not just in the case of software but yeah, um it's like you know yeah. just like in research you know you have to find the research like you need uh, some tools you need some equipment so this is why you know you have to have some rewards to fund the research and with uh the edge card project the goal you know is to create a system where basically everything is open source and free to access, you know, like when people make research, they can post on a blockchain and then there is a mechanism that is going to reward them. So the difference with the current system, you know, it relies on intellectual property. So it means that when you, when you want to benefit on the current system, you know, and you actually find something, you have to rely on the fact that you will create a patent with your intellectual property. So not only you have to wait like years, maybe five, 10 years, and you have to fund all the research in advance, but also you never, you never share the results with anybody because you want to protect it for yourself and to protect your intellectual property. But imagine what will happen you know, when we will have like um, potentially a blockchain where we will able, be able to, to share all the information and that you would not have to hide anything. You, know, you will have to, to share with people I think it will accelerate the pace of uh, discovery and also it will change the subjects of uh, the, the research because uh, there are lots of uh, diseases that not uh, nobody is working on them because like there is not a big enough market for huge companies you know so how I'll just ask how specifically mm. does the it's coming back yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> So in that system, how exactly does mm -hmm. a project or a research uh, venture be funded? Like, how is that decided? I mean, how how does that happen? Is this, is this like com planned by committee or is this something automatic on the blockchain? Yeah, so it's uh, kind of both, but it's mostly automatic blockchain. So how it... And you can write a proposal so it's uh, any kind of files you know it can be a pdf anything you know that describes yeah. what you have found okay and then you're going to submit this in uh, the blockchain and then there is there is like a voting mechanism that uh, the proposals they will be voted on for three weeks and basically people can say they will they vote uh, for a proposal or against a proposal and then depending on uh, the results of the votes after this uh three weeks you will really be uh, rewarded be with uh, because the protocol it issues a currency and like every um like every week it issues a fixed amount of currency and with this inflation of currency it uh, funds the um, research system you know so um, if you make the proposal, then 
when people will vote on your proposal, depending on the amount that uh, they are voting on your proposal, you get a part of the weekly reward, you know. So if your proposal it gathers a lot of votes, you will have, I mean, it will be in proportion, you know, to the amount of votes it has gathered. So it's, um, it's like a cryptocurrency, uh, it's a hard asset that people can own. And uh, I mean, uh, there, there is so much to talk about, you know, like, <laughs> but um, so, like, yeah. So when you vote token, I mean, so if, if someone has like lots of token, they mm -hmm. could have a lot more sway, you know, if they, uh, I, I'm just trying to figure out, or it's not yeah. like one, one person, one vote. No, it's, it's not one person, one vote, but it's like one token, one vote to some extent. Okay. So I see what I see what you're going, you know, like, yes, if someone has a lot of uh, the tokens, they can control the system. So that's why, you know, the issuance of this cryptocurrency is planned like to last for 10 years, 10 years, and to have like a, a fixed amount uh, during the 10 years, you know. And then in 10 years, you will arrive at like 21 million of this uh, cryptocurrency. And after there will be like an inflation of about two dot six percent inflation yearly and with this inflation it will finance the system so you know i think if um, the distribution the initial distribution is is done in such a way that it is uh, really owned by a lot of people and truly people from with uh, good intentions i think then um yeah like uh, if if let's say someone has like uh, five even like one percent of the, the world supply which I think it will never happen, but let's say, well, they cannot like, uh, they cannot control the voting system and the reward system with only 1%, you know? So I think, yeah, potentially, uh, yeah, I think, yes, the, the potential is huge to, to, to give, um, to give this to, to, to humanity, you know? And, um, for instance, uh, when I was talking about the incentive, there was a project called Open Source Malaria, and uh, it is a project that is aiming to find a cure for malaria with open source way. And like, it is very, very not active, you know, and uh, back in the days, you know, like uh, three, three years ago, uh, I tried to reach out to them to see what was going on, but like, it wasn't active. And the reason why it's not active is because I think they, they were liking the funding and also, uh, to some extent, the incentive to really participate and to, to, to do everything necessary, you know. So if there is a cryptocurrency that uh, can truly, you know, exist and to incentive people to make open source research, I think it can change a lot of things. Because right now, like, nobody, nobody's making open source research, you know. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I think the reason why is because we do not have, like, uh, incentive to do that. For instance... Right now, like a lot of people, they have become like experts of uh, chart analysis. Like uh, five years ago, like nobody, <laughs> nobody knew uh, how to read the, the charts and all of this. But, but uh, right now, like uh, everybody uh, knows exactly how the charts works. They, they make comments you know, on the lines and all this, like experts. And I think why it's because there is an economic incentive to do that. <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think it's because yeah, the, yeah, there is an incentive, ec um, economic incentive to do that. So that's why you know, I mean, when you think about it, like uh, reading lines of a chart, it is useless, and it, <clears throat> and uh, it brings nothing to humanity, you know. And but people do that, and then do not do open source research. Why? Because there is no economic incentive. So when there will be a cryptocurrency that will incentive people to take part in research and i think it will be a positive momentum you know where not only uh, there will be more research but the data will be shared and i think that the the pace of a discovery will accelerate you know i, I truly believe that because right now like so there is are this specifically for medical research or is it supposed to take the pay place of universities in general no it's uh, specifically for medical research you know, um, because uh, right now, like, there are too many uh, new technologies that are coming. And um, 
the current system, you know, where you have to have a small team like of uh, 10, 15 people, and you have to put like billions of dollars to create one uh, medicine or one treatment. I think this, this this system is going to become obsolete, you know, because it is not optimal. And like with um, there are too many possibilities, so that like few people cannot take uh, full advantage of all the technologies that are coming. And I think that we need a lot, a lot of people thinking about it, making research it, uh, with open source way uh, to really benefit from uh, the new technologies that are coming. You know. So I'll ask the maximalist question. Is there yeah. any reason that this system is not built on Bitcoin or some pre-existing network that's, you know, larger? Well, uh, it could have been built on Ethereum, but the reason why, uh, I mean, that's a very interesting question because I think like uh, Ethereum and other blockchain like Cardano, I believe like they are not really uh, useful uh, because I think like, in, instead of focusing on the infrastructure, they should have focused on um, the, the content, you know, because what they are trying to do is to build a huge infrastructure so that anyone can uh, do any kind of project on this, you know. So basically what happens is that they are putting a lot of efforts to build something extremely scalable. And at the end of the day, what do you have? You have things that, are, for me personally, I think are useless. Uh, you have let's say, you know, you have shit coins on, you know, on these uh, platforms, you know, that's my point of view personally. But uh, on the contrary, I think like the, the, um, the way, you know, uh, I tried with HK was like to have one specific use case, one blockchain for one specific use case and do that, you know. So basically uh, it is a fork of uh, Ethereum with one smart contract, the HK smart contract, and it does do that, you know. So it's a blockchain that benefits from all the properties of decentralization of Ethereum, but just for one use case. So, like, you have uh, the possibility, you know, to program a cryptocurrency with uh, very specific rules for one specific use case. But like, it's not; it doesn't have the goal to have all the economic um, aspect of uh, Ethereum into it, you know. Like, uh, just one use case. So. This way, there is no problem of scalability because with uh, for just this specific use case, the current uh, scalability of uh, the Ethereum blockchain is definitely enough. So it is ready from day one, you know, like uh, right now, when it will be launched, it will be ready to, to do everything that it is supposed to do. And uh, we will see what will happen, you know, but um, yeah, the idea was to create, you know, like uh, a new asset a new cryptocurrency asset uh, for this specific problem I think we have of uh, intellectual property right now. You know, like, uh, personally, I, I believe that uh, beyond um, Bitcoin and Monero, uh, the next big thing for cryptocurrency will be uh, decentralized science and the fact that we can create a new system for research with that intellectual property that is decentralized. And... Uh, we can share everything, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, I mean, did you want to talk about intellectual property generally, or um, you know, just? No, I mean, uh, just you know, to yeah, to um, so uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I think it was a it was a great chat, you know. We. Uh, we change a lot of uh, thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, well, it was nice talking to you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. You know, for 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 coming on the channel, and uh, very you know very great to, to to speak with you. You know, I I mean I really enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, you know I really really appreciate you know you being there and. Uh, also, you know, everything you have done for, um, for Monero, you know, with your, your videos and all of this, really, really appreciate him. Oh, no problem. <laughs> well, you too. I mean, <laughs> so uh, well, anyway, if uh, any other time you just, uh, you call me, maybe we can do something. Um, but uh, if any big events come up in Monero world, 
or whatever. Oh, by the way, um, mm -hmm. maybe I should ask you this off of recording, but uh, are you going to the thing in my, where, where is it, Miami or? Yeah, when they were talking about. When uh, yeah. yeah. When is that exactly? It's uh, 7th April. Okay. I, I guess I can still get a ticket. I don't know. Are you speaking of that or? Um... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anything else before we go or? No, I mean, that's, uh, again, very, very glad you know, to, to meet you. And I hope, yeah, we'll be able you know, to have other chat, you know, and um, maybe we'll meet at uh, Monero Topio. Yeah, maybe so. All right, see you around. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm going to, to stop the recording. Okay.